we're going to be entering in a new series uh, this month called Our Family. And the intent behind this series over the month of July is to take a look at whether or not, uh, well, to my hope really is, is that you have a better family by the end of the next 30 days, okay? Uh, what we want to do today especially is to take a look at the big picture around family. Now, this is not a parenting series. This is about family. It's about being a brother and a sister. It's about being parents and grandparents. It's about being a child uh, in an extended family, mended, blended, and extended families we're going to be talking about next week. We're going to be talking about the roles that we keep uh, as that, that are assigned to us. Sometimes we take them on voluntarily, but other times they're just assigned to us and how we live into those roles. And then the last week, we're going to talk about how do we really love one another, the way that God intended us for us to love each other. And today, what I'd like to talk to you about is about keeping three things as priorities in our families and about taking, about taking a look at three things to try and remove them from our families. AJ and I have four kids. For those of you who don't know, uh, we've raised four kids. They're all adults now. Our youngest is 20. We have a grandchild almost here. Uh, we're hoping that that's going to make an appearance real soon. And uh, we've got married couples in our family, and we've got singles in our family. And uh, this whole series is about taking a look at the whole broad extended family. So I'm going to be talking about parenting. I'm going to be talking about spouses and relationships. I'm going to be talking about being kids in a family dynamic all throughout the next four weeks. And accompanying a lot of these, uh, each week there's going to be a blog post that I send out to you by email. Some of you received it already about what do I do uh, with cell phones with our kids and uh, our response. So look forward to those as well on the Fridays just before the weekend. Please invite someone to come if you think that they would benefit from a series like this. But taking a step back and evaluating... One of the things that AJ and I did all throughout our relationship, when we were dating, when we were married, before we had kids, and many, many times since we've had kids, is we've had a chance to talk and to evaluate where things are going. And to be quite honest, it's usually AJ who reminded me about these things, and I kind of came along. But I realized that it's important to do that. Number one, because the stages of our family change. We were couples together. We were married together, then we had kids together, now we've got adult kids with potentially grandkids. And every once in a while, it's really important to take a step back and say, okay, what's gonna be really important for us as a family in the next year? And to take a look at how the dynamics have changed and where we are spiritually along in that journey. What does family look like this year? And how can we live into that more fully? That's the journey that I want to take us on, that hopefully by the end of the next 30 days that you can see a difference, better family. You ready for that journey with us? I think that it'll be exciting to do that together. First, let's talk about a couple of things that I want to highlight that have to be part of every family dynamic. And the first one is our relationship with God. Now, I've unfortunately heard it many times where people would say, but my kids come first right? Or my spouse comes first. And unfortunately, what that does is it removes God from his primary position in our relationships with him. I know sometimes it's not done intentionally to say that God is not a part of things. Are we, do I need to do anything here, Matt? Okay. I need to shut anything off. Is that mic on up front, right in the front seat there? You mute that. How's that? Hey, there, well, a little bit better, not much. Okay. Where was I? First of all, where is God in your relationship, right? I hear it often, my kids come first. And what's really important for us to understand in every family dynamic is that if God comes first, you will be a better child. If God comes first, you will be a better parent or a husband or a wife. If God comes first, you will be a better grandparent. And this is how I know this. Because if our relationship with God is good, we're saying, God, I'm going to submit to your will. I'm going to follow your plan, and I'm going to try and be like you. I'm going to obey your commands as best as possible. And when you do that, what happens is inner transformation begins. When we have this great relationship with God, we follow his will, we follow his commands, I become more loving, more caring, more kind, 
The fruits of the Spirit, the, the things that we're kind of talking about in all of this, right? How do we become more kind and gentle, compassionate, full of self-control? And whenever you submit to Jesus, you know what happens is that you turn towards the people around you and your family dynamic and you begin to submit to them. And when they submit to Jesus and together you do this, you lift each other up because you want the best for the other person, right? Maybe you've heard this before that marriage is 50-50. I think that that's wrong. Many of you know, I've said this many times before, marriage isn't 50-50. Marriage is 100%, 100%, where I give myself fully to the other person. It's the same thing in family. Family is not a 50-50 arrangement where 50% of the responsibility is here and there and the other thing. We all are called to live by God's rules and love one another. One of the things that we often see in, in the homes around us is uh, plaques like this. This is from our from our living room. How many of you have seen these before? Now, you know what? Family rules, right? Help each other, be thankful, know you are loved, pay with hugs and kisses, try new things, be happy, show compassion, be grateful, dream big. These are great family rules. But where's God in this, All right? One of the things that we have in our home when you come in the door is this one. This one hangs in the second hallway when you come right through the door. And for those of you at the back who can't read this, it says, Christ is the head of this home, the unseen guest at every meal, the silent listener to every conversation. And it sets the tone for my relationships in my family. Where is God in your relationships? Make sure that he is first and foremost. The second thing that I want you to highlight and keep in your family is prayer. Pray over, pray with, pray for your family. If you've got kids, you better be praying for them. If you're married, you better be praying for each other because boy, do they need it, (laughs) right? Your parents need it. Pray for your parents, pray with them, pray for them, pray over them. And it's important that we do that as families because when we pray together, as the old saying goes, we stay together, we're interlocked. What happens when you pray for your spouse is that your heart turns towards what God wants for your spouse. Your heart turns towards that person and says, I'm believing God's precious promises over you, that you are loved, you are loved unconditionally. And when you pray that over your children, when you pray that for your parents, you pray that over your family, It turns your heart towards loving and caring. And prayer is so important. I I love the fact that we have been having this emphasis on prayer over the last few months. And some of you saw my my photographs I posted on on, uh, Facebook earlier this week, praying at the old uh, Rona building. I got a lot of funny comments from you, from many of you through email and text messages. What are you guys doing? (laughs) Praying for that building? You know what? When you pray, you believe that God's in charge. God is bigger than that building. And boy, that building was huge when we stood in front of it. God is bigger than that. He's bigger than the biggest building. He's bigger than the problems in our families. God can be released to do the work that he needs in your family when you pray. Pray for them. Pray over them. Pray over your kids. We, when the kids were little, we, we prayed at mealtimes and we prayed at bedtimes with them. Uh, kids didn't have a choice. They, they took turns praying. You know, you can do that when you're a parent, you know. And they, they had to pray. One day it was for them, and the next one was for this one, and the next day it was that one. And sure enough, some of those prayers were, Lord, bless this food. In Jesus' sake, amen. Let's eat. Right? But sometimes there were moments when their life journey started to come out in those prayer times, especially when they were little. It was about hurt or pain or somebody sick or some problem they were going through. But into those teenage years, sometimes, certainly not all the time, mostly it was just give me the food, you know. Uh, But sometimes there were moments when real deep prayers were said, prayers that came from their heart. And when you put them to bed at night, pray with them, pray over them, and allow them to pray as well. One of the blessings that we've seen in our family dynamic is that our kids are not afraid to pray out loud. And they're able to express themselves and pray with and pray for others. It's been a blessing for us as a family to be able to do that. The third thing that I want you to uh, focus on uh, over the course of 
this family series is to try and emphasize um, this, uh, this idea of forgiving one another. Forgiving one another is a key component to all family dynamics. One of the saddest things that I ever experienced was uh, dealing with a couple uh, who very uh, consciously said, no, we don't forgive each other. I said, do you ever say it out loud? You know, I'm sorry, I forgive you. No, no, we never do that. I said, you know, there's a lot of unresolved resentment if you don't do that. If you're truly sorry for what you've done, express your remorse, say, I'm sorry, forgive me. And then when that other person grants forgiveness, there's healing that can happen and the relationship can be built upon those things. If there's unforgiveness, maybe you're looking into your relationship right now and you're thinking about something that happened just this past week or this past month where there's this unforgiveness that's happened and you need to extend or you need to ask for forgiveness in your relationship, please do that. It allows your soul to be healed. You see, Jesus talked about forgiveness a lot. He told parables about it. Jesus came and died on the cross for our forgiveness, for all of our sins. And then Peter came along to, uh, to Jesus and asked this question in Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 to 22. The Lord said to Peter, or Peter said to Jesus, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Now, Peter was actually being pretty generous. The Hebrew law at the time said you only had to forgive someone three times. I think I told you this before. And so he was actually doing fairly well by suggesting seven times. But Jesus' response, I tell you not seven times, but 77 times or 490. By the time you get to 489, it should be pretty easy to forgive the 490th. It's not an exact number, but it's a metaphor. Forgive because Christ has forgiven you. Put God first. Forgive each other. Pray over each other. Those are the things that every family needs to go back to again and again, which are going to set a solid foundation for your relationships. But what about those things that we want to remove? Maybe some suggestions from me this morning about some things to take away from your family. The first one is selfishness. One of the things that happens in every relationship when there's a problem, when there's a conflict, when there is stuff going on, is that we turn from the family being generous and being servants to being self-centered, and it's about me, right? When things are good, it's easy to serve your family. When things are good in your family, kids, isn't it easier to do what mom and dad said? It's easier to go out and you know, mow the lawn or clean up my room if things are going well, but if you've got a problem, if you've got a problem in your marriage, it's harder to not be selfish, to not be focused on me. One of the things that will help you and your family, if you take a step back and ask yourself, am I being selfish, is to turn it back around and serve. Jesus said, I, I've come not to be served, but to serve. The king of kings and lord of lords looked at each one of you and said, I want to serve you. I want my life to be a meaningful expression of service to you. And that's the model, right? That's the model that we need to have with one another. Love each other. Love each other in such a way that you submit to one another. The Bible says this in Ephesians chapter 5. It's not on the screen, uh, Johans. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21, it says, Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. As Christ submitted himself to death on the cross for us, we're called to submit to each other and serve each other. Now, for those of you parents who have tweens and high school age kids, uh, you know that they can be quite selfish, right? <laughs> Some groans already. I heard somebody gave me this advice for teenagers. You want to hear it? He said, uh, if you've got tweens, just stick them in a barrel, put a lid on it, and open it up when they're 20. It'll be better for you. They're hard. 
because they are so self-centered. And it's a natural expression of their cognitive development. When they move from elementary to tween years, that grade uh, eight, grade seven, all the way through grade 10, there's this shift that begins to happen where they move from being self-centered towards others centered And it's your job as parents to help them do that. Here's how you do that. You help them serve. If they've got friends that are in trouble or in need, go with them and serve them. It'll give them a model for how to be less self-centered and more other-centered. Take them on a trip. Help them do things for others. When you, as dads, when you go out and help your friends either make things, break things, or refit things, (laughs) take your kid along. Show them how to serve. Show them how to be others-focused. It's really important that we do that. Uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 10. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above, our, above yourselves. That's how we're supposed to live this life as a Christian. That we give ourselves to others. Now, do we do it really well? Do we always do it well? Do we do it perfectly? No. That's why we are a Christian. Because God forgives God forgives. When we turn to him and we say, God, you know what? I screwed it up. I didn't do it right. Please forgive me. That same sense of forgiveness and love that we receive, that unconditional love, is that love that we pass on to our children. Here's another thing that we can do. Uh, is to, There's no place for unwholesome talk in a family. When there is uh, profanity, in your relationships. I don't know. Some of you have got a potty mouth when you're angry. You know? It's an old habit. It's kind of hanging around. Or maybe sometimes your conversation is just laced with too many words that are profane. Right? I don't even like words that are close to those profane ones. Here's what happens. When you use those words when you're angry, you can cut down any chance of restoring what is obviously in that moment broken. It does more damage than good. We get angry, we get upset, and we start to raise our voice. We begin to yell. That's my problem. I'm a loud person, normally. When I I had my first full-time job, the boss in a performance review said, Martin, you're too loud. Everybody's afraid of you. You're just too loud. I remember being in the car with AJ, and I was getting excited about something. I don't know. I might even be angry about something. And I looked over, and there she is kind of huddled in the other side on the passenger seat. And I'm like, what's wrong with you? You're yelling at me. I'm like, woman, you have no idea how loud I can be. And AJ prays a lot for you. She prays a lot for me, yeah. (laughs) But profanity, yelling, all of those things cut. Harvard has done a study that says that actual verbal abuse does more harm in the long run than physical and sexual abuse. Physical and sexual abuse, uh, emotional abuse, those things rate sometimes less than actual verbal abuse does. We're called to speak life into things, right? We have been given God who loved us so much that he gave his son, gave life to us through the power of the spirit of God. If we believe in that, there's hope and there's love and there's reality. Do you know that they did a study about those words itself? They asked, they just sat people in a chair, wired their brains to a machine, and then they just said the words love, hope. And their brains wiring shifted. It turned to a more calm state. When agitated, all you've got to do is speak words of love and hope and encouragement into people's lives. We're not here on this planet to cut people down. We're here to lift them up, encourage one another, remove the unwholesome talk from each other. When we submit to each other, and we do that through the power of the Holy Spirit, that fruit of the Spirit becomes more and more part of us and we can share that love and joy and peace and patience with others. And then the third thing that I want you to think about removing from your family is this idea of dishonor, or what the Bible calls it is exasperation. Dishonoring one another. This comes from Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment, with a promise. 
so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Let me stop there. I think we missed a verse. Did we? Verse one? Uh, Honor your... Verse two. Okay. Uh, first one is, children, obey your parents because you belong to the Lord, for this is the right thing to do. And then verse two says, honor your father and your mother, for this is the first commandment with a promise. So let me talk to you children. How many of you are a child? Uh, everybody here is a child. Why is it that when we read this verse, we only think of little people, right? Honor and respect your parents. <laughs> How many of you, that's tough for you to do now that you're an adult? Yeah. <laughs> Obey your parents. There's boundaries and there's reasonable things within when we grow up as adults. But we're called to honor and respect and love our parents. Children, those of you who are in this room, sorry, but it's what the Bible says. Respect your parents. Honor them. Love them. Show respect to them. If you've got little, little ones right now, I want to speak to you for a minute because it's between the age of, I think, now this is me personally, and I think that I've read this somewhere, but I'm not sure. <laughs> but between the age of three and seven, you have the chance to form whether or not that child will honor and respect adults. It's so crucial, that stage. We'd had a lot of these discussions at home, and my kids will tell you, because I had them at home with my parents. Never was my child able to say, she said, when referring to their mother. It was always, pardon me, that's not who you call her. She has a name. She is your mother. Don't disrespect her. And it's a path of uh, teaching and to training honor and respect in the home. Don't allow your children to disrespect their parents. And especially when they grow up and as they continue to develop their mind and their thought processes, that they don't be allowed to disrespect people in authority. Because I guarantee you, if you don't teach it to them when they're young, you will struggle with it when they're teenagers. And the law might have to do it when they're adults. It's so important. This is one of the commandments. We don't think of it as being so powerful in the formation of people's character. Honor your parents. Show honor to them. Even when you're an adult, love them as Christ loved us. One of the things that I want you to recognize is that we have a responsibility. If you're a parent, we have a responsibility to train up and to teach our children of who Jesus is, of who God is. And one of the things that I want to share with you, and this is studies that have just been done, and I'm not speaking off the top of my head, is that young adults will stay connected to the church. They will be more likely to remain faithful to Jesus Christ if you talk about your faith. If you tell them the story of why you believe, if you include them in the journey of discussing how God has a role in my work, in our family decisions, in the places that we find ourselves as parents, and even in some of the struggles, how your faith is important, I guarantee you, if you don't talk about it, they won't. And until maybe God gets a hold of them in a powerful way sometime into the future, what I hope for you is that they begin hearing the stories of faith from you to begin with. But verse four here, verse four, fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and the instruction of the Lord. Dads, can I just have your attention for a minute? If you're a grandfather in this room, if you're a father in this room, you are going to be held accountable by the Lord for how you have led your family. You're not accountable for your children's decisions. You're accountable for how you have led. And your job is every once in a while, maybe it's your wife who kind of elbows you along and says, honey, we need to talk. But it's your responsibility to set the direction and vision for this home. You function, if you're in a family of two, you function as generals, co-equals. I'm not saying that there's one that lords it over another. That's not what I'm saying. But for some reason, God said, men, 
you're going to be the one I go to first. Your wife's just as culpable for good or for the bad, but men, I'm going to go to you first. Pay attention. Fathers, don't exasperate your kids. Uh, some of the things that are tough as dads and moms is that the times change. I wrote a blog post or, uh, and I sent it out to all of you about when do you give your kid a cell phone? And we never thought uh, as parents when the kids were little that we would have this problem when they were teenagers. Now new problems exist. But what we did was we always went back to some biblical principles. Is this good for my child? Is this going to show honor and respect to the Lord? Are they going to be, uh, are their minds going to be shifted into a place where that's negative or God-oriented. For us, with cell phones, it really was, you know, you've got to earn the money. You've got to show that you can manage your financial resources, and if you can do that, you can get a cell phone, which, <laughs> which helped us when they were younger, when they wanted one and couldn't afford one, because uh, <laughs> we couldn't either. <laughs> But we've got to go with the times and set some principles in place to deal with the new situations that come along. That's why it's important to step back because if you're not careful, you'll just go with the flow. You'll just go with whatever's going on. What movies do you let your kids watch? Uh, what are you going to be doing in your family, in your marriage together when, when, uh, a work, uh, when work takes one of the members of your, in your marriage one way and in one direction? And if you don't take a step back and say, hey, is this good for our marriage? Is this good for our relationship? We need those moments when we step back and ask God the bigger questions. God, what... What is it that you want in us right now? How is it that you want us to live this life? That's my hope for us in this series, that we would walk through a series of weeks and I would challenge you to step back and think, what does it mean for me to be a grandfather, a grandmother? What does it mean for me to be a spouse or be engaged? How does that relate to my faith and my faith journey? What if I'm dating or if, I'm just a kid at home. What is it that God says in the middle of all of this? See, I believe that by the end of the next 30 days, that you will have a better family if you take this opportunity to take a step back and think, God, what do you want for our family? Let's pray together. Father, we know that you have a plan and a purpose for us, but you've left us with some general principles, and there are so many details that are not in the Bible, and we just wish that you would come along and write them on the wall and fix it. But that you don't do that. You trust that we as members and people of your creation, that we can look to you through prayer, through understanding the principles in the Bible and to do the best we can with our children. Lord, forgive us when we screw up, but give us wisdom about how to be a great husband, how to be a great wife, how to live in a family dynamic where we love one another as Christ loved the church. We pray, Lord, for your wisdom and your direction. In Jesus' name, amen.